Good afternoon, everyone, colleagues and dwellers in the rare and magical community of the arts. I am so happy to have the opportunity to speak to you today. So I've titled my talk, The Agony and Ecstasy of Fundraising. <laughs> and you will soon see why. And um, I am using the podium here because when you have this topic, support furniture actually helps. <laughs> In any case, as this is a Broadway theatrical type crowd, I say let's go historical, musical, and topical. Therefore, as one famous landmark piece of musical theater declares, I tell you, my friends, we got trouble. We got trouble right here in New York City with a capital T, and that rhymes with C, and that stands for cash. Oh, yes, we got trouble right here in New York City, right here. That godly green is unseen and harder to find than a smash. Oh, yes, we got trouble. Terrible, terrible trouble with a capital T, and that rhymes with C, and that stands for cash. OK, OK, that's enough. You get my point. But as I said, if I'm going to stand up here and talk about fundraising for 12 whole minutes, I needed to do something drastic to get your attention. <laughs> All joking aside, we really do have trouble. The not-for-profit arts sector in America is struggling. We are marginalized, often miscast as elitist, dismissed as a frill, sometimes being misunderstood as being too avant-garde and incomprehensible. And believe me, after 36 years at BAM, I could write a book on that point alone. <laughs> we are overshadowed and influenced by the cult of celebrity worshipped by the public. And if that's not enough, we are dramatically, desperately under-resourced. So let's look at the facts. According to the 2017 American for the Arts Annual Survey, the arts, our field, generates $166.3 billion in direct expenditure and tax revenue for the United States of America. Woo! Yet, <laughs> combined local, state, and federal government appropriation back to the arts only amounted to $5 million. Public arts funding is 15% lower today than it was 20 years ago. But aside from the public investment, we know that in the US, funding for culture is dominated by private charitable giving. And yet arts, culture, and the humanities received only 5% of all charitable giving in the United States in 2016. Here are two large-scale examples of the public aspect of the situation. The first one is shockingly right here in our own New York State. It's called Buffalo Billion. And this is the state's uh, funding at $1.5 billion of a revitalization plan for Buffalo, New York. Just the last $500 million was dedicated to redevelopment and smart growth, innovation and entrepreneurship, workforce development, advanced manufacturing, tourism, health life sciences, and regional and economic development. Arts and culture barely mentioned. Go a little further west. Consider Prosper Portland in Oregon, a five-year strategic plan for an equitable economy. Portland is one of the most globally healthy and equitable cities in the world. The plan's components include healthy, complete neighborhoods, equitable wealth creation, civic networks, and access to employment. Arts and culture not mentioned once. The mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, on the opposite end of the spectrum, has made culture one of his top policy priorities, along with real estate development, transportation, fairness, and inclusion. Recently, he initiated a strategy to form creative enterprise zones across the city, which will allow artists and creative businesses to put down roots in an area and not be displaced by rising prices. And on top of this struggle for public and private funding, as well as the additional struggle to be recognized by many important huge city revitalization initiatives, our not-for-profits try to reflect the values inherent in good citizenship and community leadership by keeping ticket prices affordable in order to welcome large, diverse audiences. This is admirable and necessary, 
but it deepens our financial predicament even further. And yet, of course, a broad-based audience is exactly what we want, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because diversity is the most interesting thing to do. No one comes to visit or lives in New York to drink coffee at Starbucks. <laughs> they come for the variety and for what is unique and special. They come for culture, and they stay for culture. But let's get back to fundraising. We need resources. How will we manage in such an environment? Not only must we continue to grind out the best product from Hamilton at the Public Theater to an avant-garde opera at BAM to a unique exhibition of Latino painters at the Bronx Museum and so on and so on. For all of this, we need fundraising talent. We need a lot of it and it's in short supply. Literally, I get about 10 calls a day asking do I know anyone who can do this work well? In fact, recently I was told about an organization that had two simultaneous searches underway. They received 120 resumes for an associate programmer and three for a development director. Why is it harder today to find a brilliant fundraiser than an honest politician? <laughs> it's not salary, that's for sure. No matter how dire the situation is at many organizations, Chronicle of Philanthropy reported in January that fundraisers for large organizations got raises of 10% or more. And in any given year, Chronicle says about 45% of all fundraisers surveyed received bonuses. So if it's not the money, and it certainly isn't a dead-end job, fundraisers, because of their connections to program and board members, are on a direct path to the executive suite if they have talent. I can name at least eight great organizations that are headed by former fundraisers. So if there are real job opportunities, and often lots of perks like going to great restaurants and traveling with your donors, what's the problem? I firmly believe that it comes down to the fact that this work is only for those that can handle rejection on a daily basis. It is a career for the rare person who can tolerate delayed gratification rather than instant reward and who is ready to provide impeccable service to donors. And I mean both the good and benevolent donors as well as the prickly and difficult. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> An annual fundraising campaign is like a military operation. You must have a detailed strategic plan for each of your flanks, foundations, corporations, high net worth individuals, lower level members, government agencies, and then of course there is the heavy manual lifting of producing a gala. Each step of the path is fraught, and there are many mishaps along the way, causing you to marshal your forces, regroup, and try something new. It's hard. Endurance and fortitude are required. Fundraising necessitates good interpersonal skills. Think about dinner party conversation, the ability to write well and fast, perfect record keeping, solid research and organizational qualities, relentless follow-up, tenacity, good manners, common sense, and some knowledge of the art. When you say it, it sounds pretty manageable, and yet, brain surgery appears to be a gentler career path. <laughs> now, I know the donors complain about their seats, they complain about the code check lines, and did I mention food? New Yorkers are seriously obsessed about food. At BAM, we would sell opera tickets for $100. People hated it. I never heard from them. They didn't like their appetizer at the pre-performance dinner, and I would get a death threat in the mail. <laughs> anyway, this work is not for the faint of heart. And truthfully, young people today may simply not be interested in providing this level of service. Or is it possible that we, their devoted parents, made them less able to handle rejection and regular disappointment. Is that the problem? Or is it that today's professionals prefer to start their own businesses and be their own bosses? Actually, I don't know all of the psychological or sociological reasons, but despite the misery, I do want to make a pitch that at the end of the day, if you have the chops, this can be a great and worthy career. If you can do fundraising, I promise you, you can do anything. 
As a fundraiser, you are a central player at the core of your organization's success. And when you bring in a grant for the most thrilling artistic work of the decade, at BAM, I think of Peter Brook's Mahabharata, or Wilson in Glasses, Einstein on the Beach, or Kate Blanchett in Streetcar Named Desire. This is achievement at the highest level. Or feel the magic when your organization's work and the resources you have helped generate help to revitalize your entire community, moving it from desolate to robust, filled with diversity and 24-7 cultural energy. In doing this, you touch greatness. Having the money to make amazing things happen is liberating because only then can you really do what you want. And when you can pay the bill and invest in the best art makers, trust me, you are doing the Lord's work. So let's take this theme all the way to the red, white, and blue. Fundraising, like Broadway itself, is a particularly American entity, since in other parts of the world, governments actually support their artists and cultural institutions. <laughs> Here, as I stated previously, we are dependent on a broad base of contributors. But somehow, the obsessive need for money across all of these sectors works for us. Why? Because it forces us to be the very best we can be in order to deliver the bottom line. And the result is that our American organizations have a deeply engaged, long-term, vital relationship with their public. This connection is dynamic, resulting not only in names on buildings, but also in the ongoing glory of many of the greatest cultural enterprises in the world. Despite the challenges we face, the facts are undeniable. Art inspires love of learning, generates the maximum tourism dollars, houses our greatest treasures in our most splendid buildings, builds community, and after all is said and done, art is the only thing that endures from generation to generation to generation. It was because of this noble purpose and despite the hardship, every day for 36 years, I woke up, looked in the mirror and said, Karen, today you are going to raise a million dollars. <laughs> then I left for another interesting day at BAM, fired up and ready for action. So if you hear me out there and are quiet and reflective for just a moment, I think you can actually hear 76 trombones playing in the background. <laughs> Young people are lining up and getting in formation. Trombones led the they, are they are accepting the challenge. They are considering this profound, the difficult, the yet worthy career the path. The music may be faint, but it's there for sure. And it's getting louder and louder. Are you ready to join the band? Thank you.